he's letting the girl go first. It's just nice of him, isn't it? Well, I am Audrey. Um, we have been on an amazing walk and have, just to encourage you, the reason we're up here is because we have had emotional, physical, relationship, spiritual healing as a result of putting these principles into our lives. So we want to tell you a little bit, because you may recognize some of the challenges that you've had in your life um, as we show you what it's been like to walk through from being absolutely overwhelmed with these truths into it becoming the normal guarding your thoughts gateway, way of life. And you, you need to know that I'm going to tell you primarily the beginning of my story. I was conceived, and probably the first nine months that I was gestating in the womb, I was in church. <laughs> I was raised in a Christian family, a very sweet, um, conservative denomination. And my parents and my grandparents and all my aunts and uncles and my cousins, we were all in this church together. And it was... Um, there were a lot of very good, wonderful things about this family. But your enemy, and my enemy, had a plan against me and against you. And anywhere that our families and our generational lines become unaware, ignorant, or not in obedience to the word, there's a strategy that's against us. And they, you know, when you are raised in a Christian culture, you end up assuming that the dynamics in the home and the dynamics in the church are normal and godly. You, you know, as a kid, you don't grow up questioning them. Well, in this family of mine, was my dad's side was all German. And we had um, a huge amount of dedication to the church. My uncles were carpenters and electricians, and we built the churches, and we... Um, staffed them, and they, we, our family was in the choir, and they were on the board, and they were at Sunday school teachers and Sunday school superintendent, and you named it, we were in the leadership. I learned responsibility to God and a, in a wonderful worth et, work ethic in the church. The only problem was that when I was born, I was born with a double doctorate in fear. I came out of the womb with a double doctorate in fear, and a terrific generational masters in bitterness because that was what was fostered and kept alive in the generational curses in my family. The, so mixed in with Jesus loves you, become a Christian, go witness to your friends, was arguing and tension and perfectionism and the um, never being taught repentance and forgiveness. In fact, within my wonderful, and again, I, the, compared to some of the people that we've ministered to in this ministry who've been raped and abused and beaten and abandoned, I mean, the, the hideous things, I had a wonderful childhood. But the pain that I dealt with had a lot of its root in bitterness, and within my family, just within the family, the, the, the entire concept of forgiving and repenting was kind of missing from the Christian walk in that if the family did not agree with the new, le new leadership being brought in, we split the church. That was just my family. And then there was the influence that we made that we had on the rest of the people that were in the church. So the concept of repentance and forgiveness was not really there. And I didn't learn that growing up. I had a very perfectionistic dad. He was dear, he was wonderful, but he was extremely perfectionistic. And if you offended or wounded him or irritated him, you, he wouldn't talk to us for three days. It, you know, there was just this, this distancing that was really difficult. And in the midst of that, I am the second daughter. I am the fifth granddaughter of a family who really wants some grandsons. So I could tell that my family wanted a son, that the second daughter was, I never was told outright that I was not wanted. I was loved. I was nurtured. But there was a kind of a knowing that a boy was wanted. 
and that is an automatic rejection that was taught yesterday. I had a deformed foot when I was born. So all through elementary school, I was in special shoes that had lifts and things that were to correct the shape of the bone as the bones were growing, which was a very good thing for my parents to do. The only part that was tough was all of the bullying and the humiliation and the fun that was made of me at school because everybody was in their little, pretty little lightweight Ked tennis shoes, and I was in nurse's shoes that looked like they came out of an army barracks that were clunky and heavy, and I was tormented and teased and humiliated and made fun of because of these shoes. Now, you know what? Kids can be resilient. Kids can also be cruel. But in, within that environment, I also did not know and did not have diagnosed until I was 30 years old that I had dyslexia. I had learning disabilities that prevented me from decoding reading, decoding any math, decoding gr grammar, forget grammar, I couldn't get the letters in the right order, much less get the grammar right. And yet I was not bad enough. I lived in terror that I was going to be put into the special ed classes because the merciless teasing that happened to the kids in there was something that I was terrified of. So, you know, how can you pretend to understand what's going on in class? The classes were big enough that I got passed along without learning, reading at all well, math, did it really matter what order the numbers and things were in? Apparently it did. But I was pushed along throughout the educational system, but internally, my little heart, I knew I was not doing the work that everybody else around me was doing. I couldn't do it, and I could not comprehend why nobody was going to tell me straight out, you're dumb, you're stupid. Nobody had to say that. I just believed that about myself. I, I got a lot, there was a lot of verbal negatives that came from siblings and the fun that was made from friends, you know, when you have to go up and work a problem on the board in the olden days when you had blackboards <laughs> or when you had to read out loud and I would stumble over every word and everybody in class would laugh. I just felt closet stupid and nobody told me what the problem was. So it was, by, and you want to talk about self-hatred, self-comparison, Con always feeling like I was going to be exposed for being truly sublevel human. And I had words, you know, bickering that siblings do. There were words, you know, you aren't even worth the minerals you're made of. And I believed that and grabbed onto that as truth. So I started agreeing with all that self-hatred stuff. I felt stupid, dumb, I felt deformed, I felt like I wasn't worth being loved, I was more the target of being made fun of than I was friendship and acceptance, and I felt outside the group through my whole educational experience. Now, somehow, miraculously, I got through college. I majored, now I'm teaching physiology in the next couple of sessions because I majored in clothing and textiles <laughs> in college. And I managed to get through, but unfortunately I found out in the fourth year of my education that I had to take chemistry. Now that was not good news for me because I barely made it through basic math in high school and algebra, which was a requirement. And when I finally declared my major, I found out because of the textile piece, it was a, master, it was a bachelor's of science, not of arts. So I had to take chemistry and I lived in my last semester of my senior year in the chemistry teacher's office because I had to pass this class. I, I had to pass it to graduate. And they, <laughs> the professor and the assistant, I know, gave me a very unearned, merciful C- minus in that chemistry class because they knew I'd be back <laughs> and I, it wouldn't make any difference. So they mercifully let me, let me pass and just hoped I wasn't going to go start mixing chemicals and making bombs or something, I don't know, <laughs> from all the misunderstanding that I had. So in the process of this, college proved to me that I really did struggle. But again, I was in the group where it was before a lot of the overt testing, you had to be severely impaired 
in your learning to be identified or worked with or get any kind of special help. So I just got passed along. All right. In this process of hating myself, I managed somewhere around high school that I could actually get somebody to like me in a dating situation. And I began to learn that I could get somebody, I could get into a relationship with somebody who made me feel better about me, feels that, like there was something other than my learning disabilities and my deformity. So I learned very early on how to manipulate, as a Christian, relationships to meet my need where I was hating myself and I knew how to get guys to be nice to me and to like me. I also learned after a very severe broken heart early on, because usually those things lead to a broken heart, that I was never going to be hurt again. I took control of relationships and I was going to make sure that I broke off if there was any sign that I broke it off first because I had already gone through enough pain, I was not going to go through any more pain. And that led to an entire trail of brokenheartedness that took its toll on us, okay, by the time we finally decided to get married. Now, one of the things I want to tell you is in this elementary experience of school, I discovered a really helpful tool to help me deal with school and the problems and the pressure and the fear and the terror I had. And that was when I got sick, I didn't have to go to school. <laughs> So when tonsillitis came along, or the flu, or bronchitis, or something like that, the term that Jesus used, that's used in the word, is spirit of infirmity. And I want you to understand, your enemy wants to give you solutions that are completely not God's. Health is God's solution. But when you know you cannot have to go to the place that causes you terror and torment because you can be sad and pathetic and wheezing and sneezing at home and mom will give you soup and let you watch television and sleep in her bed, which would you choose? So when I knew that probably two to four to six weeks a year, I could agree with sickness and enjoy it and be away from the pressure of being at school. And you know what? It's kind of like a drug. You can try it and you can think that you're the one that's in control. But eventually when you do it enough, you give the foothold to the enemy to be the one who then starts to pull the strings. And when you don't want to be sick, it doesn't matter because the enemy's right there to give you what you have opened the door to. So I dealt with earaches and bronchitis and, all, and, and the kinds of, of uh, invitation to viruses and, and colds that would lay me out flat when I didn't want it, when I was working and my work, my work performance was really important. Okay, so we have the fear, we have the anxiety and a tremendous fear of man, horrific fear of man. My experience with man is that man was dangerous, they laughed at me, I was humiliated and hurt and wounded, not men, people in general. And I wanted to be a teacher but the only problem is you have to be in front of people <laughs> and they can laugh at you. <laughs> this is a problem. So I squelched majoring in education and I went into the clothing and textiles industry, ended up in, in fabric retail. But I basically said to God, I had, a, I had a desire. I'd line all my dolls up and I would teach my dolls, and I'd write all my letters backwards and upside down, and none of my equations worked, but it didn't matter because my dolls loved me. But and I knew that I had a passion to teach, but there was a problem that I'd have to be in front of people, and I just basically said to God, your plan doesn't match my plan because it involves people, <laughs> and they're scary. So no, I'm not going to teach. Well, obviously, God changed a bit of that in my life, okay, as we're here. All right, the... Ah, where am I here? Okay. So we hit college. I go to work after college for about 10 years, and I meet this marvelous man. Now, I'm in church. I'm on the worship team. I'm in the choir. I'm involved in, in growing. There were a lot of things that the Lord taught me spiritually in that season of my life, which were very life-giving. I, I loved that season, and I decided that this marvelous worship leader who was in church was a catch. <laughs> so after eight years of knowing each other, we got married. And 
we, you know, it's, you know the, I, I was filled with every Hollywood romance story that was out there. I didn't read. I never read for enjoyment. Reading was just torment. So I, I, movies and, and all of the stories that you can hear, I loved them. And, and this man was going to fulfill my life. <laughs> so I brought all my fear and all my bitterness and all my hatred and all of my self-hatred into this marriage and said, here, make me feel wonderful. <laughs> it's your job, God said. Okay? Now, the only problem was he brought as much baggage into the marriage as I did. Is that fair, I ask you? Is that fair? No. Now, we, and he, some, what, somebody said that, I think you said this yesterday, when you're hurt, you turn around and you hurt others. When you're hurt by others, you turn around and you hurt people in your life. When you're wounded, you turn around and you wound people in your life. And let me tell you the dynamics in my family from growing up were well rooted in place and his dynamics growing up in a Christian home were rooted in place. And when we came together within that first year, we went, oh, what have we done? As Christians, of course, we hid it from everybody. But it was a, now you think, I think most people, when you make the commitment to get married, God makes you, requires you to make the commitment before you really know what you've gotten into, kind of like parenting, because it takes a commitment with, to God, and then you walk it out. He teaches you how to walk it out. So we got married. I, let, I, I had this thing right here, the, the channel of life and death, my mouth, and I learned that bitterness I learned how to just cut him off at the knees. Okay, I, I, pfft, I knew how to do that. And I learned, but I never did it, of course, in front of anybody that could see it, because that's how I learned you do it in your family. You know, you argue and the blood flies in the car, and then you get out at church and go, oh, God, bless God, how are you today? Isn't God good? Okay, that's, that's what we did. So by the 16th year of our marriage, actually, let me just say this. We had a daughter uh, four years into our marriage, and we were planning to have more. I was a late life mother, and we were planning to have more. And she was absolutely the gift of, you, you know, she, she was an absolute blessing to both of us. When I, uh, when she was four, but before she was born, we knew we wanted to homeschool. We just wanted to have, I, I knew she could possibly have the same issues that I did in learning disabilities, and I was not going to have her go through the humiliation that I did. So we decided that we were going to homeschool her. When she was four and a half years old, I was 40 and I was diagnosed with progressive breast cancer. Now, all that bitterness in my life, I want you to know that all that bitterness in this German side of my family, my grandmother and all of her sisters died of breast cancer. This is on my dad's side. The genetics come, the sins of the fathers come through, so you can have it from either side, but the bitterness was learned. Well, it doesn't mean that my mother's side didn't have bitterness, but I learned it really well in the culture there. So I had breast cancer. I had to go through a mastectomy. I went through radical chemotherapy, blew out my immune system. I could barely walk. And by the time I was done with chemotherapy, it was time to start homeschooling. So I kind of wove my way through, and we started homeschooling. And within those first couple years of homeschooling, I started having panic attacks. I developed depression. I had an overgrowth of yeast. I developed allergies to everything God made. I became addicted to Vicodin because, I, because of the surgery, and then it helped with the pain of the relationships and the terror that I would not live to see my daughter grow up. It was, I went into massive full-blown fear. I had panic attacks, I had chronic fatigue, I had adrenal exhaustion, I had co constant chronic sinus infections, I had dysrhythmia of my heart because the chemotherapy was, was so severe. It, uh, there was not a part or piece or system in my body that was functioning. And I was a Christian. And once the diagnosis for the uh, uh, allergies came, I started sliding to the point that literally my diet was nuts, roots, twigs, and bark. That was about all I could eat. I was off of everything. J everything normal. I was allergic to fluffy. I was allergic to the atmosphere. I was allergic to the environment. I was allergic to everything. While we're homeschooling, my health was just sliding, and I'm a Christian. Okay? My, life did not, my life looked more like the poster child for the enemy than it did for God because of the destruction 
that was going on in my life. I lived in terror and panic attacks. Every morning at 5.25 in the morning, I would wake up with a panic attack like I'd been thrown a cl- a cr- down a cliff, off a cliff, and I would just crawl through the day until 5.30 and fall asleep on the sofa. I had no energy at all. All right, 16 years of marriage, and my health going like this, and this charming, wonderful, sweet, lovely wife that he had, I don't know why he became such a problem, but I threw him out at 16 years of marriage. And I said, when you decide you want to be married, you can come back. Blew him away, and of course, he was the whole fault. Now, he's going to have his chance to tell the version of this, okay? From my perspective, (laughs) he was the problem. It didn't matter that I was on $400 a month of supplements and drain on our, you know, the needs in my body were just um, consuming our finances. And I was broken and sick. But I made this declaration and I sent him away. And after a year of separation and working very hard on the marriage, we came back together. And just about that time, our pastors, Wayne and Chris, said, we've heard about this, this ministry in Georgia. Pleasant Valley, Henry and Donna Wright, do this, do this ministry that teaches these things, and we want to go learn about it. We want you and this missionary and Chris, our pastor's wife, to go and check, be spies in the land. Go check out the land. So it was a two-week program. They were going to learn all this stuff for the sake of ministering to others. I was going for me. I was living on inhalers and medication and antihistamines and, and um, antidepressants and every kind of medication. I was supported by Pharmacia. My, I took a suitcase. It was just supplements and sustaining to this two-week stay. And I was like, God, I feel like this is my last trip, my last coach out of Dodge. If I don't get help, I need you to meet me. If you, if you can't help me, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm in the process of dying. I'm not going to make it. So we went, and we sat like you did, except it was 12 to 14 hours a day for seven, seven days a week, including Sundays, and we started learning these principles. And I started realizing that I was a total captive, that, there was, that I had no comprehension of the truth of God that God wanted, wanted to use to set me free, and I started taking it in. Now, I had deaf and dumb spirit, I had brain fog, I had confusion, I had all this learning disability, inability to learn, and I maybe took in 2% of what we were learning, what you're learning. And, and you know, you start to feel like your brain is like full up to here after yesterday. I was barely taking in 2% of what the information was. But let me tell you, I confessed and I repented for everything in every list, even if it was stuff only men could do. Because... <laughs> Because I have men in my generations who have delivered some of this stuff to me. And I thought, I'm not leaving any rock unturned. There is going to be no demon unidentified by the time I walk out of this place. So I repented for everything. I identified the phenomenal rejection, self-rejection, self-hatred, self-bitterness. Bitterness grows like a cancer. I was going to get this beaten because I suddenly had tools and an understanding from God's maintenance manual how to identify the enemy and take him out before I just gave him full access to me, my relationships, everything. So we come to the end of the first week. I'm, I'm making my own food. We are, you know, my, I took my nuts, roots, twigs, and bark with me. And I'm, I'm just you know, taking, wake up in the morning, take a puff on the inhaler, have a full cup of vitamins that get me started in the day, and then I lay there to get up. By the end of the first week, Chris and I, and the other gal that was with us, went into the cafeteria. Now, not only was I eating only nuts, roots, twigs, and bark, no sugar, no, no milk products, no flour, no wheat, no nothing. Walk into the cafeteria, and I began to realize up to that point in those last couple days of the first week, I had no back pain, I had no headache pain. I didn't need the Vicodin, I didn't need the inhaler, I didn't need, now stay on your medications, go with your doctor. But the things that, were, that, were, you know, had, that I had choice in, to ta- in taking, I thought, well, I'll just test this for a day. And I began to realize that my body 
within seven days, the allergies were gone. There were cats roaming everywhere on this property. I had no response, negative allergy responses. to the It was spring. Everything was blooming that would have just put me into um, asthma shock. Went into the cafeteria, and I said, okay, God, I'm testing this. You are good. You are faithful. I can tell that I am being healed. I'm going to test this. I went over, and I got a slab of chocolate cake. That would have sent me into anaphylactic shock eight days earlier. Okay? I sat down, and I ate the whole thing, and Chris is just going, <gasps> can I get you another? <laughs> From that point on, my body has been on a healing curve. The allergies are gone. I can eat anything. The headache is gone. The back pain is gone. The neck pain is gone. The terror is gone. The self-hatred is gone. Now, let me tell you this. I lined up like you are within seven days. Then there was another week where it got all reinforced, and we learned how to minister to others. When I came home, I had to believe God that the transforming of my mind was a daily choice of taking my thoughts captive because if I went back to the fear thinking, I would be open the door again to the allergies. So it started me on a path that you want to talk about encouraged. Uh, it, was, it was a phenomenal encouragement. And of course, I sat there going, oh man, I'm going to go home and fix him. Man, do I have stuff to, to he, I know what he needs. And God said to me, no. When you go home, you will be silent. The only thing that you're going to do is maybe answer his questions. It is not your job to fix him. I am the one that fixes men. You leave this in my hands. You zip your mouth. The only thing you can do is speak life. Now, that was a new concept, <laughs> learning how to speak life. That was a learning curve that was a transforming thing that I had to learn. So when I came home, and I would, he, you, know, you know how a little interaction would just be triggered between people that have lived together for a long time? He would say something, I would start to say something, and God would go, uh, 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 and I'd go, hmm. I'll be right back. And I'd have to leave the room to take my thoughts captive, to figure out what life thing I could say and turn around and go back and speak to him. Okay, so now I've taken more minutes than I'm supposed to, and he gets to talk about what it was like living with me, which wasn't pleasant, <laughs> up, up to my healing. <laughs> you did good. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll catch up with her in a minute. Am, is, my green light is on. Am I on? I can't hear me. If you can hear me, though, that's good. You can. Is All it right, on? Perfect. Okay. To say that I came from... Wiped out? Okay. <laughs> Halfway down to my tonsils. Um, to say that I came from a dysfunctional family would just be a ridiculous understatement. My, my whole family could be the poster children for all of the, all of the um, principalities in your syllabus. Uh, in fact, my family won the Dysfunctional Family of the Year Award <laughs> 19 years in a row. I, that's an impressive record, isn't it? Um, I had a challenging relationship with both my mom and my dad, but my dad by far was the most difficult for me. And I, I need to, to provide some kind of context for that. My dad's um, parents both were immigrants from Europe. My um, grandfather from Norway, my grandmother from Switzerland, she came with, uh, I think they had 12 siblings in their family. Uh, they grew up on, my dad grew up on a, a little family farm in um, rural northern Idaho. He had an older sister who was a princess. Um, she specialized in giving parties. When she gave a party, however, mom and dad had to stay in the kitchen because she was embarrassed by their broken English. So um, do I hear a Jezebel, you know, forming? She took control of everything. Younger brother was a golden boy. He was charming. He could do anything. And um, mama would tell my dad that you need to do... Clarence's chores for him because he needs to go play baseball with his friends. So my dad was the sort of cinder fella, you know, in the family. Um, they, the family was involved in a, a buggy, horse and buggy accident. When he was two years old, he fell out of the buggy, landed on his head, probably broke his neck. They don't know that for sure because he wasn't bleeding, so there didn't seem to be any reason to take him to a doctor. But he grew up with a lifelong stutter. 
he was um, very sort of awkward socially. He had a very difficult time expressing himself. And if you saw him on the street, you could easily mistake him for a homeless person. That was sort of the demeanor. Um, that, that's kind of the way he saw himself. And I can, I can probably best kind of describe his role in his family with this, this story. Uh, both my dad and his younger brother were in the Navy in World War II. And just as the war was drawing to a close, his brother, who worked on seaplanes, uh, they had a plane that was um, anchored off of the China coast and the Yangtze River. It was December. It was very cold. Um, the, the, he had to do some work out on the wing over the water. It was slippery, icy, and he fell in the water. They saw his head bob a couple of times and never seen again. Now, it was not unusual in that era to have multiple sons in the military, but if it got to the point where there was only one son left, they would pull him out, send him back to the, to the family to help with the, the family business, the family farm, mom and dad, whatever. And that's what happened to my dad. So he was sent home. home. When he got home, his mother met him with this statement. Why couldn't it have been you? What a piercing thing to hear, especially from your mother. Uh, my grandma, as I just mentioned, was from Switzerland, and Audrey and my daughter, uh, our daughter Chelsea, and I had a chance to go to Switzerland a few years ago, and I thought, you know, I'm going to look up, I'm going to find that little village of Lafue in Switzerland where my grandma came from. So I started reading about the ge genealogy of the family, uh, one of my relatives had written a, a book that was the genealogy, but it was sort of in story form. So it was very entertaining. It was very interesting. And I'm, I'm developing this picture of this kind of idyllic um, scene in, in the foothills of the Swiss Alps where, you know, Heidi and grandfather come down from the mountain with Peter the goat herd, and they run across the Von Trapp family cresting the hill, and everyone bursts into song. And, you know, it's this sort of bucolic, sort of wonderful, you know, Thomas Kincaid painting. And... Um, then I get to the part in the book about where great-great-grandfather murders great-great-grandmother and gets away with it. And I thought, well, that's never come up at the family picnic before. I'll bet you, since I'm just razor sharp, I'll bet you this is an entry point of the enemy. I started thinking about the relationships in our family, husband and wife relationships, they were horrible, all of them. Bitter, contentious, bickering, you know, antagonistic, caustic. It's just like, ah, uh, you know, the people just hated each other. And it's like, I saw that all the way through. I mean, clearly this was a generational curse um, in, in full bloom. Now, my dad was always proud of the fact that we never had a divorce in the family. I thought, well, no, in our family, when the going gets stuff, we just kill each other. It's like, ah. Uh. Now, it was interesting to, for me as an adult to have that insight, to, to get a grasp of the context and the culture so I, I could understand the rejection and all that kind of stuff. But as a kid, it didn't matter. When you're a kid and you're being molested and abused, um, everything's scary. Everything hurts. Nothing feels safe. Now, I could have been a bubble boy. If we'd had bubble boys back then, I would have, could have been a bubble boy because I also was severely allergic to pretty much everything. Horrible allergies, hay fever, um, serious asthma. I had to sleep kind of sitting up much of the time. On my home, way home from school, I often have to stop at the doctor's office. That just kind of became a routine. I had to wear a mask when I would go outside because you know, my eyes would water and run and itch. And my nose, it, was just, it was awful. Outside was awful. In wintertime, when it was snowy, that was good. I loved the wintertime. But the other three seasons, not so much. Um, and when my mom would want to send me outside to play, I would think, are you paying attention at all to what's going on here? That's a torment to go outside. When I was a kid, I was a, um, a creative, artistic, musical, sensitive, tender-hearted little kid who um, felt things deeply and cried easily. And I was an embarrassment to my mother because I was a musical, creative, artistic little boy who was sensitive and cried easily. 
And it didn't take me very long to figure out that there was something just inherently broken about me. That I was made up of miscellaneous parts and pieces that just didn't really work right. And I began to start hating myself at a very early age. I also connected the dots not too long ago that I was an unwanted third child. My family lived in a very, very small um, one-bedroom apartment, maybe 400 square feet, tiny. And my dad was building a house, but very slowly. It took him 20 years to actually finish it. And my mom didn't want to have more children until there was more room, but he sort of pressured her into it. So the fact that I was breathing, she resented. The fact that I was a little boy she could not understand and connect with was just another layer of um, rejection. I, I didn't think about this until last night. I, I feel like the bastard's curse was in effect, even though my parents, as a third child, obviously did not conceive me out of wedlock, but there was, the, there was this unwantedness about me. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna say, though, God is, is gracious and merciful because a few years ago, we heard a teaching by Arthur Burke on redemptive destinies. If you don't know that term, go look him up because it will bless you enormously. It's, he, it's taken, this teaching is taken from Romans 12, the seven spiritual gifts in Romans 7. Um, and he teaches on each one of them, got through the first six. Of course, I didn't relate to anything. The seventh one, though, is called a mercy. And he said, when I teach the mercy, I have to do it completely differently than I teach all of the other six because the mercy is so different from anything else. The mercies are kind, gentle, artistic, musical, creative people who feel things deeply, are sensitive, they cry easily. And I thought for the first time in my life, I'm not a broken mistake. God actually made me this way. I'd been fighting that my entire life. I'd been hating that my entire life. And I'm still in the process of grabbing hold of God's design for me. Um, it, it, was, it was hard to have a relationship with my mom and dad because I think they wanted to on some level, but my dad especially just didn't know how. He was so full of unloving himself. He was incredibly judgmental and critical. I couldn't do anything right. I could hold the screwdriver, couldn't do that right. Hold the hammer, couldn't, that wasn't right. Hold the board, that wasn't right. Nothing I did was right. He'd want me to come and work with him and then spend the entire time telling me what I was doing wrong. So it was hard to develop a relationship like that. Now, I, I was musical and fairly good at the piano. I started taking lessons when I was 10. And by the time I was 12, I was the primary musician for our church. I actually wound up playing for a second church. I wrote music, I arranged music. But I never did anything that my dad approved of. My dad never played an instrument in his life. He could not sing. He was tone deaf as a stump. He just, you, I think he thought he was singing harmony, and trust me, he was not. Um, so he knew nothing about music, but that didn't stop him from knowing everything about the piano. So there was never an opportunity missed for him to critique and judge the music I played. My mom was very stoic, uh, silent, withdrawn, isolated. I think she just curled up in her shell and hid for most of her life. That was her way of surviving. Now, there was greater potential, I thought, in having a relationship with my mom. And so I actually was look, I was just, I was just gonna assume that my dad would die first. As I mentioned yesterday, he had been dying since he was 22. It took 68 years to get there, but he was so preoccupied with dying, I just knew that he would die first, but he didn't. My mom, who was healthy as a horse for the first 83 years of her life, developed brain cancer, didn't find out about it until it was stage four, and she was gone in a very short amount of time. And when she died, these words came out of my mouth. Why couldn't it have been him? That very same curse, that generational murderous heart that I so, was so offended by in my grandmother was coming out of my mouth. Okay. In spite of the relationship I had with my dad, once I started getting hold of the principles in this ministry, I began to forgive him. 
That's not a one-time thing. It was a process. Every time I would talk to him, I would have to forgive him just sort of second by second because when his mouth was open, he would just vomit out the most hideous things. Um, of course, he didn't know that. He didn't, he didn't see that. He was just you know, sharing his heart. But uh, it, was, it was pretty awful. Um, and for the last three years of his life, he was in an assisted care facility, still lived in Idaho, so it was not easy for me to get there to see him in person. We talked on the phone um, a fair amount. But I did go to see him. And on one occasion, I really felt like God wanted me to... This is the mercy boy here wanted me to repent to my dad. Now, this man had done despicable things to me, but my response to them had been sin. I was angry. I was bitter. I was, obviously, I had a murderous heart toward him, and I felt like I needed to repent to my dad, so I did, and he forgave me, and then he asked me to forgive him. Now, I don't know what that really meant to him, But what a gift it was to me to hear those words come out of his mouth. Of course, I forgave him. And then I gave him a father's blessing. If you don't know what that is, you have the opportunity tonight to experience what what that is. But essentially, it's someone speaking into um, a person at whatever stage of development they are, but as if they were a child, and saying the kinds of things that a, a loving father would say. I'm so glad you were born. You have such a beautiful set of giftings built into you. I mean, things that just came, you know, it was a download from the Lord. I can't really remember what I said, but he was sobbing and I was sobbing, and it was a very tender, poignant, touching moment, and, um, and it was beautiful. I will never forget the painful things that happened, but the memories don't have pain associated with them anymore. The pain part is just gone. Um, I was with him when he died. He, he died. We, we all decided to go home and celebrate his 90th birthday, so we did. Uh, he was so frail. From the previous time I had seen him, he looked like a concentration camp survivor. He was just skin and bones. Everything was hard. Eating was hard. Breathing was hard. Swallowing was hard. You know, moving. Was, everything was hard. So he had his birthday, and he was exhausted. I took him down to his room. I, he couldn't get out of his wheelchair, so I picked him up and tucked him into bed like he was a little baby and made sure his you know, feet were warm and his pillow was fluffed and kissed him on the forehead and told him I loved him and meant it. And I said, Daddy, I know that things are really tough. Your world's gotten very small. Life is pretty much about pain right now. If you want to give up and let go, that's okay. I'd had a conversation with him and God a few days earlier where I was reassured that he was going to be with with the Lord. His heart had gotten um, healed. So I said goodbye. Within a few hours, he'd gone into a coma, and a few few hours after that, he died. I know that God gave me those moments with him because I forgave him. It opened the door to such healing uh, that it it, it really impacted me, obviously. Okay, back back a few years, Audrey and I get married. I'm bringing this truckload of generational garbage with me into the marriage. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. I thought she was the one who was screwed up. I thought she was the maniac. I thought she was the one who was just foaming at the mouth crazy. Um, I hid the first year of our marriage, I hid the guns. I had to hide the guns. I figured if she finds a gun, one of us is going to die, and I think it's looking more like me than her. This is, it's going to be ugly. Now, in retrospect, I can see where I pushed all the buttons, I pulled the chains, I knew how to make her spin around, spin around like a top, um, but at the time, I didn't really understand that. Now, we we decided we would go to counseling because that's what you did then. And we went to counseling. Oh, Lord in heaven, we went to counseling. We did Christian counselors and secular counselors. We did psychiatrists and psychologists and MFCCs. I even went to um, a Christian hypnotist. There's got to be a special chapter in your book for Christian hypnotists, or the occult book, yeah. Um, that, that was, I, I only thought about that last night. 
it was, it was just, you know, goofy. Uh, but we, we did everything we could think of. And I finally did get the message that I was screwed up. I got that part finally. It's like it actually penetrated. But it's like, okay, how do you go from screwed up to healthy? How do you get from screwed up to normal if there you know, it really is such a thing, at least better than, than where I am? How do you do that? And it was really unclear. So, yeah, when she kicked me out, it wasn't because, you know, she had a hangnail or she had a bad hair day. I deserved to be kicked out. I was a horrible husband. I'd done just about everything you do to blow up a marriage, you know, several times probably. So I, I deserved it. Now, it, th this year wasn't a year. We were apart for about a year. It wasn't a year where we went around and played. Um, we really worked at things. Wayne and Chris very generously allowed me to stay with them for a couple, three months. Had to have been the longest decade of their lives. I am, I think I'm what you would call a high maintenance, ha maintenance house guest. Um, I'm, I'm pretty high maintenance, period. But we, we eventually got back together, and things, things were, you know, a little better, kind of, eh. <laughs> not so much, really, but we wanted, you know, we wanted it to be better. She went to Georgia, and... When she talks about the diet, you know, she's really not exaggerating much. We ate, you know, uh, bark and dirt and sticks. And for special occasions, we could have bugs, you know, the extra <laughs> crunchy protein. That, that was only for special occasions. Though. So when she said she was eating chocolate cake and washing it down with bourbon, it's like, whoa, <laughs> this babe has gotten freed up. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't bourbon. It was vodka, maybe. I, it's... Well, that's, that's just for medicinal purposes, right? It's, or cleaning or something. I, I get confused. But when she came home, what impressed me more than the diet stuff was that she stopped trying to fix me. Now, up until this, po this point in our marriage, Audrey had been confused about what her role was. She was convinced she was meant to be the Holy Spirit. She sucked at being the Holy Spirit. <laughs> She wasn't any good at being the Holy Spirit, but that did not stop her from trying to be the Holy Spirit in my life. And when she stopped, it was just shocking, but, you know, in a wonderful way. And I thought, I wonder if this is going to last. You know, I would see her come in and the wheels spin and turn and the smoke steaming. I knew what she was going to say, and then I knew what I was going to say, and I knew what she's going to say, only she's, she wouldn't play. She stopped. She's like, she wouldn't start the game, and so we couldn't ever do the game thing. And eventually then, not only was she stopping with the destructive stuff, stopping trying to fix me, but she did start speaking life to me. And there's one example I remember really vividly. She came in um, one day, the wheels are spinning, she stopped, and then she took my hands and said, you have such gifted hands, I love your hands. You paint the most beautiful pictures on our walls. I have a whole drawer full of beautiful cards you've calligraphied. When you sit down to play the piano, I am instantly transported into the presence of God. There's an anointing of worship on you. I love your hands. And then she turned and walked away. Talk about having power. Ladies, you have no idea how much power you have when... You demonstrate your changed life. Audrey was literally laying down her life for me. She was becoming Jesus to me. And that's what impacted me. That's what softened my heart. That's what made me decide, I don't know what they got in Georgia, but I got to get me some of that. So I went to Georgia. Now, I could only go for one week. And like her, I repented for everything. Only in my case, it was different because I'd actually done everything. So, you know, there was that. But I repented, and um, we, oh, the most wonderful thing happened back there, in addition to what happened to me, I was seeing something I'd never imagined before. We, and you know how you all kind of sit in the same place, you know, when you have, do it, like you're all sitting in the same place you did yesterday? We didn't make you sit there. You just went there because that was your seat. Well, same thing. So the, there was a little couple sitting um, next to us when we were there, and they, were, they had uh, four fairly young children that were staying with grandma four states away. This young couple had had a pretty rough, rough go of things, but they were going through the repentance prayers and forgiving and healing and, and repenting and forgiving, and, and 
Four states away, their children are getting healed of physical things they had had for years. The kids weren't doing the prayers. They had no clue what mom and dad were doing. But because mom and dad were being obedient, the blessings just chased them and grabbed onto their kids. There was a guy on the other side of the room from Texas. He had spent $200,000 out of his pocket, in addition to all the insurance payments, trying to heal his little girl who was with him at the conference. She was in the sort of children's version of this. We had a lunch break. Um, he walked in to pick her up for lunch. They, the little girl knew she, you know, kind of like Audrey, had to eat nuts and twigs and dirt. But somebody had had a birthday that day, so they were having birthday cake. And, you know, someone just per, put... The, the birthday cake in front of every, every little child. He walked in the room. He saw the, the fork full of cake on its way to her mouth, and he started dialing 911 on his cell phone because he knew as soon as she swallowed, she'd go into anaphylactic shock. Well, she swallowed, and then she took another piece of cake, and nothing happened. And she took another piece of cake, and nothing happened. She's getting healed because Daddy is being obedient. That's such a powerful thing for us as parents to grab hold of. It was a wonderful thing. The reason we do this is because the ministry, the principles transformed our lives. It changed us. It saved our marriage. We feel like we got married to new people without all of the um, challenges of going through divorce and finding you know, new partners. So are we, are we done? Oh, gosh, no. You know, there are layers of things that come up, like the onion. The, we just keep digging, but we are so far from where we started. We actually enjoy each other. We do a lot of laughing. The things I do to make her laugh would just scare you to death. But she thinks it's funny, and that's really, you know, she's my target audience. So, um, you know, we have fun. We're, we're next week bumping right up into our, our 32nd anniversary, which is really cool it's just it really it, it is the mercy it really is the mercy of the lord and audrey because uh, you know without her being willing um i seriously we would be dead with with the cancer she had the depletion in her body the bitterness the anger the fear she was an ideal candidate to get cancer again and this time it would have blown her out i was on such a self-destructive course i would be dead too i am convinced that that these principles, when we started applying them, saved our lives. I know there are people here, either physically or here, watching, who are desperate. You, in your heart, even though your face may not show it, it's like, I am. if this doesn't work, I'm done. I'm done with my marriage. I'm done with God. I'm done with life. I'm, just, I'm done. And I want, I want to encourage you, God has heard those people cries in the night, those tears in the night. He's not blinded to that, and he's, he is saying, I'm hearing you. Hang on. Grab the rope and hang on. Calvary's on its way. And last night, <clears throat> in the middle of the night, when I didn't happen to be sleeping, I started getting a download for this group. This hasn't happened before. This is kind of new, and I, I sort of checked it with um, Audrey this morning. And said, and said, is this, and I said, is this the pizza? She said, no, we didn't have pizza last night. It can't be the pizza. It's got to be from God. So what I saw was, was the group of you, not inside the building, but standing in, you know, outside in very tattered, worn clothes after experiencing a long-term drought, dry, dusty, barren, used up, um, so desperately wanting uh, a, f a few drops of water on the end of your tongue just just to feel some kind of moisture. You, you're exhausted, depleted, no energy, no strength. No, you, know, you can't take a step because you're, you're just done. And within the snap of a fingers, the scene changed to a torrential downpour, sort of like in a rainforest. Everything is green and lush, and those tattered clothes were just stripped away. You're being refreshed and fed and renewed. And I feel like God is saying, that is my heart for you. That is available to you right now. Just grab hold of this. It will transform your lives. You will be a changed person. I hear your heart cry. 
and I'm answering. Just take it. Just receive it. Just, bit it. Just get wet. Just stay under those sheets of water because they're going to be coming at you for a long time. The battle. And I, I'm on. One of the main things that we want to encourage you in is your enemy has a strategy against you. You're going to be in warfare fighting every day. But would you like to be tired and exhausted at the end of the day and be the victor and be healed and be taking back territory? Or do you want to get to the end of the day with all loss? Because you're going to fight one way or another. The enemy is going to try and bring you into battle, but he doesn't want you to know. So the encouragement is take those, start taking your thoughts captive. Who authored those thoughts? Is there life or death in that thought? If there's death in the thought, it's authored by your enemy. Don't let it out your mouth and don't agree with it. It's going to feel like you are in boot camp without ever enlisting. I mean, you have to enlist because you have to make the choice. But God wants you to know that with this dream, to me, says he hears the cry of yeah. your heart. He knows, just like for me, going back, for us, going back, this is it. I've got to learn something here. There's got to be a breakthrough to truth that I have just been separated from. And you're here, guys. God loves you, and he wants, he wants all of you to be Dean and Audrey's. Mm -hmm. He wants you to be you for the kingdom of God. Yeah. We just finally got the message. We, fi we finally yeah. got on board with God. Yeah, this, you being here is not an accident. This is right. a divine appointment. So grab right. hold of that. Yeah. Thank you, oh, sweetie. Bless you. Bless you.